Thank you all for joining us today. Good morning and after, good afternoon. My name is Eden Ruiz Lopez, and I'm the project manager of the National Center on Elder Abuse. On the NCEA's behalf, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Starting a Shelter, Building a Movement, the Critical Role of Shelter in the Coordinated Community Response to Elder Abuse. Next slide. A few housekeeping items. We'll keep it short and simple. Here are a few ground rules just so that everyone has a set of expectations for today's webinar. So to limit noise and interference, all of our participants will be muted and put on listen-only mode. The NCEA will be moderating questions. If questions come to mind, please enter those in the Q&A chat pod and we'll address them in the Q&A segment towards the end of our webinar. And if you can't find the Q&A chat, Todd, you could simply enter the questions into the chat box and the NCEA will be moderating both. Finally, the webinar recording will be made available through the NCEA's website in about one to two weeks, so you'll hear from us in the next couple of weeks. A majority of elder abuse awareness and education-based work that we do within the University of Southern California Department of Family Medicine, including customized trainings like this collaborative webinar today, are initiated through the NCEA. We are one of 27 federally funded resource centers and our specialty is to provide members of the public and professionals with the information that they need to detect and prevent elder abuse. We focus on getting field related information out regarding education, research, policy, and best practices. Next slide. At USC, we have a number of projects that are all an offshoot essentially of the NCEA. Some of our most notable projects are currently training resources on elder abuse, and that houses over 260 sets of training curricula, and we perform regular quality checks on all of the resources that have been vetted by elder abuse experts. You have the ability to filter through results based on target audiences, for instance, and you can even tailor, tailor your search according to self-directed learning or teaching others. And there are many educational topics to choose from, such as curricula on physical, psychological, financial exploitation, and neglect, in addition to prevention, domestic violence, caregiving, and a wide variety of other topics. We are also the lead disseminator on something called reframing elder abuse, which is a communication strategy devised to help us all have more productive conversations about elder abuse. We have provided technical assistance to a number of agencies, including the Postal Inspection Service, foundations, and several aging service providers. What we're trying to ensure here is that the recommended messaging is thoroughly incorporated in our web content and publications. I'll tell you a little bit more about that shortly. The Elder Abuse Guide for Law Enforcement is a very comprehensive online module that was initially designed for law enforcement, but it's a useful guidance tool virtually for anyone. Um, going out in the community who may need access to local social services, for instance, or information about legal statutes, evidence collection suggestions, and finally supports and tools for elder abuse prevention is one of our newest initiatives that was created and we turn to the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging to determine what resource material was needed the most to spread the word about elder abuse. Next slide. In your downtime, we highly suggest that you check out the wealth of free resources that we have available. These are all the project-related websites that I was talking to you about on the previous slide. You also have the ability to even contact us on each website, so we encourage you to do so. And if you have any questions or would like to, for instance, submit content for consideration, please, we encourage you to reach out to us. Next slide. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to today's presenters. Years ago, I actually had the pleasure of visiting Hebrew Home, and it was such a serene and peaceful environment. I was honestly blown away by the experience of having the opportunity to visit. Fast forward a few years, we connected with Joy and Malia again, and they told us about all of the incredible progress they were making with something called the Spring Alliance and their efforts to provide people across the country with more technical guidance and actually create a network to support the elder abuse shelter movement. Today, from our two presenters, Joy and Jessica, you'll be hearing more about the elder abuse shelter model. 
So, Joy, I'll turn it over to you and let you take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you um, to NCA for hosting us um, today, uh, this afternoon here in New York, and I know morning time in, on the West Coast. Um, and to the people that are listening uh, for, for joining us on this important conversation. Um, and always um, a thank you to our funders and supporters who are helping us do this really important work. Um, we're really thrilled about the opportunity to have this conversation today um, about shelter. Um, you can go to the next slide. So it's really important to understand that um, most people who are experiencing elder abuse in the community will likely not need shelter, um, but for those who do, it is a critical component of a coordinated community response. And our goal for the webinar today is really to talk to you a little bit about what the Weinberg Center looks like, um, how we create shelter, the ways in which we're supporting others to create shelter, and then, of course, to hear from uh, one of our colleagues on the West Coast who um, is, has created shelter and, and how they've done that. So first, to talk a little bit about the Weinberg Center, um, we were the nation's first shelter uh, for elder abuse victims who experience um, abuse in the community. Uh, with a shelter located um, in a skilled nursing facility. Uh, the Heber Home at Riverdale is a 600-bed long-term care facility in the Riverdale section of the Bronx in New York. When we created this model, um, we created it without bricks and mortar. We used the existing infrastructure of the nursing home and all its professionals, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, was a low cost model, which is one of the things that is really critical. And um, over the 15 years that we have been in operation, we have really identified the five most important pillars of our work, which include um, shelter, which I'm gonna talk about, um, replication efforts, which includes the Spring Alliance. Um, we are focused a lot on legal initiatives and outreach um, a little bit. Um, it was designed that way because I am a lawyer. Um, the CEO of the Heber Home is a lawyer. So we kind of were a little bit uh, legal heavy um, and that's our model. But again, the model that we wanna support you building in your community um, really has to do with your resources and, and your needs. So this is just um, a reflection. The legal heavy is a reflection of kind of who we are and what our needs are. Um, we uh, participate and create extensive outreach and training programs um, about elder abuse and uh, elder justice and shelter. And the other most important pillar of our work really is partnerships, that this is uh, the issue of elder abuse and elder justice is one that needs to be solved with partners and in collaboration. We feel so strongly about this. So really everything that we do, we try to do um, in partnership with others. Next slide. So our model um, works um, in um, a way that re reflects and supports our community and the way that your model um, should work um, should also be a reflection of your community and what your resources are. Um, when I talk about the Weinberg Center today, um, please remember that uh, our model is, has had the opportunity to have 15 years of growing and evolution, um, mistakes, successes. Um, so some of the work that we're doing you know, clearly has some time behind it and um, it's reflective of that. Next slide. So for the Weinberg Center, um, we are the hub of our model is located here at the Heber Home at the Riverdale, a skilled nursing facility. Um, we, the Weinberg Center team, receive referrals uh, and we'll talk about all those different uh, referral sources. Um, my team, uh, which consists of lawyers, public health professionals, case managers, and social workers works together um, to look at uh, the calls that come in, our referrals, um, to um, make de decisions about who is appropriate for um, admission, and we'll talk about those details. 
Um, an assessment is done when that person comes in. A medical, um, we figure out where that person uh, should be placed within the skilled nursing facility. Our shelter model is virtual so that there's not a specific location on the campus that is the shelter. Our clients will be placed within the skilled nursing facility in a, a unit or what we call a neighborhood because this is their home um, that supports their medical care. So if you came for a visit um, as Eden did those many years ago to the Heber home and to visit the shelter, we would take you on a tour of the whole campus because our clients are placed on the campus in, uh, in a way that supports their medical care. When they get here, um, they are given social and legal services directly from the Weinberg Center and then they will be receiving all of the services of the skilled nursing facility. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, our goal is to, through a trauma-informed lens, understand what our clients want um, in terms of discharge. And then our goal is to uh, make that happen for them. Um, and that safe living environment could be back into the community where they came from, into new housing, or they might be discharged to become long-term residents of the Heber home if that's what they choose. Um, so again, the, the model really starts from the community referral all the way to the goal of understanding what these clients want um, and helping them to, to make that happen. Next slide. Um, and you can click again, great. So this shows um, this, uh, the, the circles around that center are our referral uh, sources and there'll be a slide coming that will kind of show you where most of them are coming from but we do see all of these places in the community as um, referral sources uh, for us and in the center where it says types of shelter sites um, what you'll see is that we have different models because maybe in your community um, you don't have uh, a big skilled nursing facility like we do um, and maybe your model will include um, some rooms in an assisted living or um, in some communities they're using foster homes as the site of shelter um, maybe it's the a legal service uh, a legal services agency who acts as the hub but you'll see um, that the model is really designed to support and look at what is your community um, need? What are the resources? And then how can we build a shelter around that? Next slide. So in 2018, um, you'll see that we had 82 adults who were referred to our program and three quarters of them were coming from hospitals and social service agencies. Um, what's really important about this is our catchment area is all five boroughs of, Manhattan, of New York City and Westchester County. So we have a lot of older people who um, are technically eligible for shelter, but in 2018, there were only 82 adults who were referred to our program. So one thing that's really important for you to know is that if you do start a shelter program, you're not talking about thousands of people showing up at the door. Um, the number of older people who actually need shelter and are appropriate um, is, is pretty small compared to the number of people who are experiencing elder abuse. You can go to the next slide. Our criteria for admission into the Weinberg Center are generally these five bullets. Um, important, again, that we share all of our um, materials if this is something that you're interested in doing. And these criteria are ones that we've established. The criteria that you will set will be ones that make sense for your community. So you'll see the person must be 60, is experiencing one or more forms of abuse or as at serious risk of abuse. They're referred by professionals. So if, if an older adult or family member calls, we have them call a professional um, to make the referral, whether it's a, a, a doctor, APS, or some other professional. Um, the person needs to agree or their guardian that they, that they uh, will come here. And we do have a no contact um, with the person who caused harm. The first two weeks the person is here, uh, there's no contact. That helps us identify who's safe and who's not. Next slide. So in terms of payment, a really important question people are often asking is how do we get paid for this? 
Um, about 85% of our clients, um, and it stands to reason, are um, low income, um, maybe poor in poverty, often caused by the abuse. So we are able to get them on Medicaid or Medicare. Um, and here are some other ways in which we sometimes receive payment through insurance. We do have foundation grants. We have some city, county, and federal funding. Uh, and we do an annual fundraiser every year. But again, primarily people that are coming into shelter are Medicaid eligible. And again, this is a state, uh, something that we work with other people to look at what the state regs are and try to help them see if we can um, help, help them to um, get their people coming in also on Medicaid. Next slide. Um, the average length of stay for clients coming into the Weinberg Center is about 30 to 120 days. Because we are in a skilled nursing facility, every discharge needs to be a safe discharge. So people um, are staying a little longer now than really when we started uh, back in 2004. Um, and a lot of what's happening is to delay it or to make it longer is finding adequate housing court system and court processes taking a little bit of uh, a little bit of time and really allowing people who for the first time are in a safe place um, getting medical care um, housing um, all of their needs taken care of the the process of healing and integration really do take a little bit of time so we are um, you know we're okay with um, this uh, this general length of stay next slide Again, our team, the Weinberg team, is an is a interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary team um, working together. But your team um, should reflect the needs and resources of the community. Many of the partners that we have on the Spring Alliance um, really have one person who is doing uh, the shelter work um, and using the community supports for all of the other work. Um, so again, this a breadth and depth of our team reflects 15 years of growing, um, but, but um, you know, this I think is something really to be aspiring to in terms of shelter. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, we are fully integrated with um, the Heber home staff. So when our clients come in to shelter, um, they are receiving the services of the entire skilled nursing facility. Um, working closely with the clinical team, of course, um, housekeeping and food service, working with our finance department um, and development in terms of um, grants and grant writing. Um, of course, we work closely with security to make sure that um, they are safe and everybody is safe and we're keeping out people um, who, who do not belong here on campus. And of course, also working closely with our therapeutic activity staff um, who are providing all sorts of uh, uh, therapy, um, art therapy, pet therapy, drama therapy, music therapy, to help the clients um, that we have deal with um, some of the trauma that they are have experienced in addition to the work that's happening on our team um, with our social service department. Next slide. Uh, this is just some statistics. We'll go through this really quickly. Uh, 2019, we've had 31 referrals. Um, and um, you'll see from prior years, we're up into the 80s in terms of referrals. Um, we imagine that this is gonna continue to kick up, um, particularly as the, the colder months come and holiday seasons come, we, we generally see a big uptick in the fall and winter. Next slide. Um, in, it, in terms of admissions, again, I really wanna be clear um, in terms of the number of people that, that come into shelter. Um, even in a place like us where we have such a large catchment area. Um, the largest number we had was in 2017, 23. Um, in 2019, um, as of July, we had seven. Uh, I believe we have another client coming in today. So really we're up to eight. Next slide, please. Um, we've, whoops, can you go back one? Thank you. Um, so since we opened, we've provided about 142,560 days of shelter. Um, and this includes some of the clients who have transitioned to long-term care, um, but are still receiving uh, some services from the Weinberg Center team, um, maybe related to some ongoing legal issues or other therapeutic supports. Um, but we're so, 
pleased that we've been able um, to provide this many days of safety um, for the many clients that we've had since they've been here. Uh, next slide. So really important to kind of break down what are the elements that you need and your community need for um, necessary to create shelter. And, and really we've worked um, hard to identify these critical elements um, to create shelter that is successful. The first is a champion. Um, and I think this is probably true in most programs um, that you create. You really need to identify someone who owns the project, is committed to making it a reality, and can marshal the necessary support. So even though, you know, we are a team and, um, you know, there's many people who contribute to the success of the Weinberg Center, you really need to identify one person um, who's a champion of the project. So I would say if you're thinking about doing this, that is one of the most important steps that you can take is who's going to own this project um, and fundamentally be responsible um, for its success. Um, the second element is appropriate housing. So um, some shelter models that we have in the Spring Alliance, and you'll hear about that a little bit more, um, they may be using a couple of different nursing homes um, that they're using for shelter. So the hub may be a legal service agency and um, they have five or six different skilled nursing facilities that have agreed to take clients on a rotating basis. Um, but the communities need to be able to accommodate uh, older adults that have a range of needs. And so clearly to create shelter, you will need um, some housing and housing solutions. Um, the third thing is a network of support services. Um, shelter is really one piece of a multifaceted and coordinated community response to older victims uh, in need of often medical, psychological, legal, and social services. And really a lot of these things are necessary to address the needs of clients that you're gonna see. So um, that network is um, really critical to bring together. And in many of the conversations I've had with people um, who want to start shelter, they'll say there are all these different services, but we're not linked, we're not really coordinated. Um, the one common thing we all know is that we need a shelter system. Um, so part of the, the elements that necessary for this creation is bringing people together. And I, I just think that's just a huge benefit um, for every community anyway, to really bring these services together. Um, the fourth thing is awareness, widespread awareness. Really, uh, the most successful shelters have worked when people know what elder abuse is, um, how to make referrals to a shelter, and um, what are the ways and what are the things that the shelter can offer and do and what are the things that a shelter is limited in doing um, and part of the way that that gets out is by providing regular outreach and training um, it's been a wonderful thing for the heber home um, to be engaging in conversations and education around elder justice throughout new york um, it's been great for us as an organization um, and really great just uh, for elder justice um, and, and clearly important to get out the word about the Weinberg Center. And then finally, um, shelter actually isn't that expensive. I mean, we are providing skilled nursing for many, many people in the community. Um, and so having someone come here who has been a, a experienced elder abuse um, is part of the work that we do as a nonprofit skilled nursing facility. Um, but the Additional things that you may need for shelter, maybe legal services, therapeutic services, um, those aren't free, obviously. Um, and so a combination of government funding, cost sharing, some philanthropy, these are a mix that really work well. Um, one of the ways that we really wanna help people is to try to figure out what are some of the ways to be funded and um, some creative thoughts about that. Next slide. Um, so these are some of the lessons learned um, for us that shelter is critical for a coordinated community response. Uh, trauma matters. We all need to be trauma-informed and understand that and look at our clients and admissions and 
uh, discharge through the lens of trauma, um, the, the critical elements of the shelter, that older people have unique and diverse needs. Um, and we've really learned how to start capturing data, why that's important. And we think that's such a, an important part um, of advancing elder justice and the shelter movement. Next slide. Um, so we just continue to innovate and evolve. This is one of the ways in which I think this work is important and interesting and exciting. Um, we recently received a VOCA grant um, to support transitional services. So for clients who are being discharged, um, we really felt like they could use some bridge support um, to get back into the community um, in a, as healthy a way as possible. So we're really thrilled about this new VOCA grant that we got that's gonna do that. Next slide. Uh, so we started something, the Weinberg Center, about uh, eight years ago called the Spring Alliance. Uh, Spring stands for Shelter Partners, Regional, National, and Global. Our goal was to create a network of shelters with, and other similar service models where we could work together, share resources and technical assistance, and create a community of support. Um, I'm so thrilled about how far the Spring Alliance has come. Um, every year, uh, a different shelter hosts um, a symposium and a gathering of all the shelters. Um, just this past year, we met in Buffalo, New York, and um, at one of our sites there, and just really amazing how this network of people work together um, to share resources, help each other along, and really start this, um, continue to grow this movement. Next slide. So one of the really important parts of the Spring Alliance, and please go to the website at springalliance.org, um, is to help others um, create shelter. Uh, this is certainly one of the most important parts of my job is to really help others. Uh, this is a, a, a frame from our, um, from the website, and you can pick, go to the next slide, please. Um, and you'll see that on the website, there's ways in which um, we, um, people can get all this material, including, including um, FAQs about joining the shelter movement, um, really understanding what we've done in 2019 for the Spring Alliance. And then you'll see um, there was a resource guide back in 2017. All of the people in the Spring Alliance, and you're all uh, invited to join the Alliance. Um, we, we share all materials, things are available. Um, people can easily um, uh, access who's there, who belongs, so you can be talking to all different members of the Spring Alliance. And certainly people are also welcome to come to the symposium. Next slide. Um, finally, this is just a, a list of our most recent members in the Spring Alliance um, and across 13 states. We have had other uh, shelter programs begin and for various reasons, um, you know, I think primarily lack of funding and lack of a champion um, that have not been able um, to continue. But for the most part, um, the members that, that have joined the Alliance um, really benefit from being part of the Spring Alliance um, and um, have really helped each other to succeed. Next slide, please. So finally, um, for, for more information about all of uh, the work that we're doing, um, please, these are some links that you have. The, the monograph that you see on the left, this yellow uh, cover um, is a document that we, the Weinberg Center, put out in earlier this year, um, which, can, which really goes into all the different models, um, one that may look closer to what your community needs. So uh, that's available online. Um, the going home video is the story of a client, um, a Weinberg client who, who went home this year. Um, please look at the video. It really helps um, give you, let you look and see um, what that looked like and how that happened. Um, and certainly please go to the Spring Alliance or the WeinbergCenter.org um, for more and detailed information. Um, of course, we're happy um, you know, to share all of our material and I'm certainly available for questions at any time. Thank you so much and I'm thrilled to um, turn this over to my colleague, uh, Jessica Hernandez, who's just been uh, an incredible partner 
in developing the shelter movement um, on the West Coast. All right, thank you so much, Joy. Um, and I'm happy to be here to talk about Sonoma County's emergency shelter program um, that is in embedded into Adult Protective Services. As I said, I'm Jessica Hernandez, and I currently supervise um, a unit in Adult Protective Services as well as our emergency shelter program. Next slide, please. So today I'll provide an overview of Sonoma County's emergency shelter, how we're connected and embedded to adult protective services, along with what APS has seen as a need for shelter for some time now. Um, I'll also discuss the shelter design that we chose, why we chose this design, the housing options identified within our community, and lastly, the steps we took to creating shelter, essentially where we began and a few considerations for beginning your own shelter. Next slide, please. So shelter inside APS, there's been a demonstrated need for shelter for victims of elder abuse and dependent adults um, for years now. APS has witnessed a continued growth of this population. And before our shelter program, elders, which in California is defined as a, an individual 65 years and older, and dependent adults, those between 18 and 64, have really been without a sufficient resource if they were re ready and willing to leave their um, abusive situations. And at this point, because our program is embedded into adult protective services, this program is only available to individuals with an open adult protective services case. And when the social worker, the investigator, makes contact with, um, with the elder or dependent adult, usually by making an unannounced home visit, they have direct observation to the abusive situation and the state that the, client, um, it, the client's in. And, with, and I'll go into this a little bit later, but we have sheltered from the time that we opened our doors 11 clients, and five of those have actually agreed to leave in the moment at the first point of APS contact. Others that we've served have been first, um, first served by domestic violence shelters, our local family justice center, and even homeless, uh, homeless agencies within our community. Next slide. So seeing that we had a clear reason to create shelter, um, as I said, many were ready and needed to leave. When, we, when APS made the first point of contact, they would end up at the hospital, and APS would advocate for admission, and the hospital was the right resource at the moment. But the client was often left with no other alternative for no alternative option for shelter. And so this is what occurred. We would see the hospital trying diligently to um, get them admitted into a skilled nursing facility or a domestic violence shelter or a homeless shelter. Sometimes it would be a rush placement with family and friends or the worst case back to the abusive situation. Um, and we have seen that in adult protective services where people will choose because the other options aren't really viable and they're not what the person needs, they'll return back to where they came from and in, in, the, in the state that APS found them in. And the skilled nursing facilities, if they're eligible or if there's a custodial bed, custodial bed available, that would be an appropriate placement, but not everyone that is, ends up at the hospital needs skilled nursing level of care. Um, the traditional domestic violence and homeless shelters are not really able to meet the functional and unique medical needs and the psychosocial needs of the people that we serve. And for example, one of the first clients that we served actually um, she was in a, a domestic violence shelter, and I believe she was in her early 70s and had sleep apnea, and so she needed a CPAP machine. She also used a walker due to severe arthritis in her knees and hips. And the women at the shelter, the women's shelter that she was at, were giving her a hard time because her walker blocked the walkway. And the bed that she was staying in didn't have an outlet for her to use her CPAP machine. So this is just one example of how um, some of the, the traditional models of domestic violence and homeless shelters aren't really equipped to meet the, the unique needs of older adults. And so given this, Sonoma County really wanted to find a better way to support um, victims of abuse, and certainly we knew that the feedback we were receiving from our local hospitals, that they also wanted a different way to support um, victims. 
So in 2017, California Office of Emergency Services provided counties with the opportunity to, I'm sorry, next slide provided counties with the opportunity to um, apply for a grant specific to housing services for victims of abuse. And as the last slide showed, there was a gap in services to how our community responded to victims of elder abuse. And our county realized that this was the perfect opportunity to create shelter and to try and fill this gap. And I'll provide a bit more detail on our program development and timeline later on. And so the, the funding that our shelter program received was a VOCA grant. VOCA KE is the name of the grant. And with this, we created our shelter program. Next slide. Um, the referral sources, as I mentioned earlier, and, and as a part of being embedded into Adult Protective Services, is only available to APS clients, so those with an open APS case. And once the APS investigator determines that the victim has a need and is willing and ready to leave their situation, consider for, consideration for shelter is given. As Joy mentioned earlier, not everyone experiencing elder abuse needs shelter, so the numbers are small. But when they are enrolled into our program, um, the services that they receive is 45 days of temporary housing, which is accompanied with up to 30 days after once they leave shelter of case management. The people that we have served so far have needed that extra 30 days of aftercare and case management in order to reintegrate into wherever it is that they are discharging post-shelter. We provide safety assessment and planning. Um, the social worker completes a psychosocial assessment and a nursing assessment. We have public health nurses embedded into adult protective services that complete a level of care evaluation and a health risk assessment for the folks that we're enrolling into our shelter. And as I mentioned earlier, the medical and functional needs of the population that we're serving, we wanna ensure that where they're going for shelter, those needs are going to be met. We have wraparound case management service and victim advocacy. We work really closely and in tandem with uh, an elder advocate at our Family Justice Center that's able to help, um, help our APS clients in shelter get um, emergency protective orders and go through the process to um, obtain a, a longer term restraining order. And the social worker in this program that's working with our clients is also doing permanent housing search assistance with our clients. Next slide. The time that it took to create um, our program has, it's been ongoing, um, but this is, gives a, a general outline of the different stages that we've seen. And at the initial stages of our grant, we planned for six months. From December of 2017 to May 2018, um, we used a retired APS supervisor actually to begin all of the initial stages of research, make contact with other shelters, and began organizing community stakeholder meetings. And this is also when we found the Spring Alliance and partnered with Joy and spoke to, I want to say, at least maybe five other shelters within the Spring Alliance to help us get ideas how they built their shelter um, and provide us with some support in where to begin this, this huge but much needed feat of creating shelter in our community. Serving clients June 2018 to September 2019, our grant um, runs through the end of this, or this September. We've served 11 uh, APS clients have been sheltered and we've outreached to 11 different agencies, 170 of which are mandated reporters. We started with our major hospitals and community clinics, as well as our local regional, regional center, um, because under APS, uh, we also investigate and, and will shelter clients that fall between that dependent adult ages of 18 to 64. And the program continuation, we recently submitted our reapplication for another year of funding to our um, Cal OES. And we realized from the previous 15 months that there were a lot of people that we're seeing in the community that were contemplating leaving their abusive situation. Not everyone that we encounter is ready to leave. And what we know is that, that it takes multiple times and a lot of education and safety planning for someone to decide to leave. So we've worked in um, into our reapplication. We want to serve clients that are contemplating leaving their abusive situation and in situations where the abuser has already been removed. Next slide. The design that our shelter um, 
took on is a virtual model. And Joy spoke a little bit about the virtual model within the Weinberg Center. And what this means for Sonoma County is that there's no designated structure, um, brick and mortar building that where victims are sheltered. Rather, there's identified locations for shelter spread throughout our county that are equipped to meet the client's needs or with supports, which we have the ability to put in. Um, the shelter is primarily based on the client's level of care needs, their functional and medical needs, and we keep safety and distance from the abuser in mind. For example, we um, recently sheltered someone that was really embedded and connected to the northern part of the county. They lived in the northern part of the county and um, in discussion with our client realized that there was a high likelihood that her abuser would find out where she was because of the small nature of this region. So we decided to put her at the southern end of the county to help um, increase safety and ensure that her safety needs were met and that her shelter location wasn't discovered by her abuser or anyone in the community that might share with her abuser. Next slide, please. So the housing options that Sonoma County identified were independent living, assisted living, and skilled nursing care. And as I mentioned, we really aim to shelter those that are within the community based on the medical and functional needs of the individual. Next slide. So for those that can live independently or with some supports, the shelter options that Sonoma County has identified is motels, um, a one bedroom furnished a apartment in a senior community, as well as a foster care model. For the, ho for the hotels and motels, our county established um, letters of understanding with the different motels and met with hotel management early on to describe to them what it is that we're doing and um, to see if, if those specific sites were able to meet the needs of older adults. I've, had, um, I've asked uh, Joy with the Spring Alliance to upload an example of an agreement that we made with a, a local motel, so that's available for anyone that's interested to see that. Um, we made the site visits to these motels early on in the planning process. The relationship with hotel management and staff is ongoing. Um, and I know that our social worker has her, her favorite picks in which motels are best equipped to meet the needs of our, of our clients. The senior housing, um, the one bedroom furnished apartment, we contracted with a local nonprofit. Um, for support to oversee the daily operations of this apartment, to furnish it and actually provide some light case management for the victim that is sheltered in this apartment. And the foster care model, this is a community-based home setting. The, this program is still in development, or this resource rather, and we're partnering with a local um, nonprofit in order to create this. And my hope is that this is soon to be coming available to our shelter clients. Next slide, please. Assisted living and skilled nursing um, has been identified for clients that have a higher level of care. Um, and we contracted with an assisted living facility and prepaid for a bed to remain available. This was a shared room, um, and at the time it was available for a female client. And for those that needed a higher level of care, they, had a skilled, they have a skilled nursing need, um, we have an agreement with the facility. It's not a contract, but for our community and for our program, we realized that the access point, um, the easiest way to access the skilled nursing facility is actually through the hospital first. Next slide. So creating shelter in your community, as I spoke earlier, the planning process for Sonoma County, um, we carved out six months in our grant. And this is where um, we had our funding source, which was the VOCA KE grant. Our agency, Adult and Aging, was the backbone agency. Joy um, mentioned this as the champion. The one person or the agency will really have um, a pull and, and own this and own this project and own this, um, this program, but this is really a collaborative effort. And we knew this going into, the, into creating shelter. So to identify your backbone agency, those who, those who have successfully created shelter in their community, as I mentioned, we relied on the Spring Alliance to help us connect with other, other programs across the country that have done this. And we're using a model similar to what we imagined Sonoma County doing. 
Um, identify your community partners in elder justice, those that have pull and commitment to filling this gap um, in service for the seniors and dependent adults in your community, and identify the resources that already exist in your community that can be leveraged. The assisted living, for example, that we contracted with, we had extensive experience working with them in other programs within our adult and aging division, and they came to the table quite quickly realizing that we were doing another innovative um, uh, project and program. So they, they were there partnering with us and wanted to be a part of um, this program. Engage your community stakeholders and bring them to the table. I can't emphasize this enough. During the planning phase, Sonoma County hosted two different stakeholder meetings um, and asked for ideas in how, we, how to create shelter in your community. We welcomed creativity and really um, appreciated and welcomed the pie in the sky ideas because from there, you, it, it stimulates other ideas and maybe not everything can actually come to realization. For example, I think someone thought, well, maybe we could buy you know, a building. Well, the county didn't have the ability to buy a new building, but what we did do is um, we, we developed and we're in the process of developing that foster care model um, and trying to network with people in the community to um, those that have specialized um, knowledge of older adults' needs. And so in sum, we were able to, to work, from, work from those ideas to create shelter. Commit and invest. Be bold. Ask for a commitment of resources for short-term housing from your key decision makers. This is when Sonoma County established agreements and contracts, for example, with motels, pet shelters, our assisted livings, and other local nonprofits. Um, this is the time that Sonoma County really brought people to the table and said, you know, this is, we want your collaboration, we want your input, and we want, we want to solve this problem and create this program together. We're going to own it and, and run it, so to speak, but we know that this is a community effort. Next slide. So here are some potential community partners that you might consider yourself. Um, this is not an exhaustive list whatsoever, but um, I can say probably with the exception of a private elder law office, our, our program has had a touch and in communication with all of the different agencies listed within our community. Um, so think about who, who it is in your community that you might you might believe will come to the table to help you create shelter in your community. And the last slide, next slide, <laughs> is, is the link to the sample hotel agreement, the sample pet agency agreement, um, and our first letter that we wrote to community stakeholders to get people engaged and, and bring, them to, um, bring them to the table in order to begin thinking about how we were going to create shelter in our community. And Sonoma County's model and the method that we took to getting there is just is one way to create shelter. It's not the only way. And I know Joy was mentioning that too earlier on. Each community is distinct with what they have access to. And shelter models, that includes the different shelter models, the funding sources, how referrals are made. It all might look different based on what you have access to and what works for your community. And to really create something that works for your community. So thank you for having me. Next slide. My contact information is there. I'm happy to speak with those that are interested in knowing more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joy and Jessica. It was such a treat to have you on today and collaborate on this webinar. Both of your cities and counties are undertaking some tremendous work here. And thank you so much for taking the opportunity to talk in so much detail about all these successes that you're having with your shelter models. And of course, more importantly, for creating a structure of support for older people. So let's go ahead and move into the question and answer segment. I have been seeing some questions trickle in in both the chat and Q&A box. So I'll go ahead and start with addressing questions to Joy and then Jessica, and I also noticed that there were some questions that probably apply to the two of you combined. So um, the first one that I have is for Joy from April, and she asked, with regards to security of all clients, are the residents who are not clients of the shelter made aware that there are shelter residents among them? So thank you for the question, April. Um, 
Uh, we work in terms of, of security and safety. We work um, with our security department to make sure they know um, who's coming in uh, and who is not permitted on campus. Um, we have one uh, point of entry into our into our whole campus, so our 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 gate is very secure. Um, other shelters across the country do not necessarily have one point of entry, and so again, you need to design it based on what the resources are and what your campus looks like. Um, we other residents um, don't necessarily know that our clients are here, that Weinberg clients um, are here. Um, and the same way that um, within a skilled nursing facility, there might be residents who say, I don't want this particular family member coming or some other family member coming. And no one really knows that except the security division and administration. So um, we have not felt that it was uh, necessary or appropriate to inform other residents um, about uh, you know, who are shelter clients or who are not. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that has worked out uh, just fine. I mean, all um, skilled nursing facilities um, need to make sure that they are, they're providing a safe work environment as well as a safe living environment. Um, and we do that for every single person that comes on our campus, um, Weinberg Center included. Thank you, Joy. And I think yes. that also answers her, her second question of has extra security been made available? And clearly with your model, you have one entry point, so. Yes, thank you. Of course. Um, so the next question for you is from Sarah, and she wanted to know what your typical demographic is in diagnoses. And she mentioned that she finds that at our hospital, most individuals we encounter experiencing abuse have a diagnosis of dementia and we have difficulty placing at facilities from that point forward. So we do have, um, and we have had many clients who come with a diagnosis of dementia um, and some uh, hospital transfers, um, we will do that prior to a guardian being appointed, some courts, do not want the transfer coming um, without a guardian um, being appointed to that person. If that's what's appropriate, you know that's what's appropriate. Um, because we are a skilled nursing facility, of course, um, one of the great benefits is that we have a memory care um, neighborhood here, so we are well equipped um, to deal with older people. Um, you know, who have a diagnosis of dementia or have other cognitive impairment. Um, we, you know, we see that as one of the great benefits of the, of the model in this way. Thank you. Um, and then Joy, I actually had a personal question for you. Um, I understand that you were saying the range of stay for your shelter was between 30 and 120 days. And I'd just like to know what's the longest amount of time that you've ever housed an older person in your shelter. I can imagine the multitude of challenges you experience if you have um, an older person, for instance, that you're trying to move back to the community if it's determined yep. that care placement isn't essential. Yep, so it's, a, it's an important question, um, Eden. And we, in the video that um, we have the link to, the this, um, woman was here with us for a year. Um, and, and the reason that it took so long, uh, there was a criminal process that was going on um, there, or she wanted, she really wanted to return back to her home in the community. Um, it took a significant amount of time uh, for us to get uh, support, getting that abuser out. Um, actually it was more than one, so getting them both out um, because of the destruction to her apartment. Uh, it took us a while to get that cleaned and repaired. Um, she had some medical issues um, that needed to be supported here. So um, she was finally able to go. I think she was with us for a year. And she, you know, what was so great is that she was very clear um, that that was what she wanted and whatever needed to happen um, for her to be able to do that. Um, she, she was willing to participate and engage in to make that happen. 
Um, so yeah, it can it can definitely take a long time. Yeah, and I can imagine, especially in New York. So yeah, um, thank you for for sharing that. Um, and yeah, I course. hope every yeah, I and, yeah we'll the, the housing the you know affordable housing um, is. I mean, it's interesting because I think that the housing, not having housing is one of the reasons um, that that older people um, get caught up in abusive situations. They let people in or people come home because they can't afford it or, you know, a new friend. And then it's just that which makes it so hard for them to get home. So uh, it's, you know, it is, um, it's a big problem for sure. Okay, so moving along to Jessica, we do have one question from Sarah, and she asked in particular regards to your shelter model, are the individuals that are coming in primarily experiencing physical, emotional, or financial abuse? Um, I'd say it's a combination of all of those, uh, certainly, certainly physical, um, and with that, psychological abuse. Um, we've seen certain people that have, you know, where their abuser um, has taken over their finances. And um, so all, each one of those things that you mentioned are actually so intertwined and embedded. It's not atypical for a shelter client with an adult protective services to experience all three of those things. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for expounding upon that. So we do have some questions for the two of you combined, so feel free to just jump in and interject whenever you'd like to. So Mona wrote to us, one of the needs we're seeing in Seattle is more and more elder people entering homelessness. While they may not be coming from an abusive situation, clearly these elderly people need special care that most shelter systems cannot provide. Do you have any information on shelter that provides services to elders? Our day center for homeless women has seen women in their 90s and 80s. Jessica, do you want to go first from the APS? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, I will. Um, I agree with what um, you said. Mona from Seattle was was discussing. Um, so. Our Adult Protective Services has also seen an increase in elders that are experiencing homelessness um, for the first time later in life due to a number of reasons. Um, and our one of the other programs um, that Sonoma County has going, we are awarded a Home Safe grant. So that's Cal O was a grant um, that we applied for and received called Home Safe. And it, the the goal is to, is to prevent homelessness amongst um, elderly seniors and dependent adults within the community. I don't know of any other shelter programs that are able to meet the needs of those of those individuals, um, but we do know and are seeing a, a tremendous increase in those types of re reports to Adult Protective Services and are very aware of the, the unique medical and functional needs of the individuals that are becoming homeless um, first time later in life. So with, our pro with this program, the Home Safe program, um, we're able to provide some financial assist assistance to prevent um, housing insecurity. Uh, there, we also have a part-time legal aid attorney as well as longer-term case management to work with the person. Um, and this is separate than our emergency shelter program for victims that are needing to flee abusive situations. I don't know, Joy, if you have anything else to, to add to that. You know, just I think that it's, um, you know, I think a lot of cities um, are and places across the country are seeing this increase in homelessness um, mm -hmm. uh, of older people. And, um, you know, two things. One, um, I always tell people when they're starting shelter to be very clear about your mission, what you can't do and what you can do. And um, we can't solve all of the problems. I mean, we, we seek to solve this one very important and critical gap in service, which is um, you know, people who have to leave home because it's not safe anymore. Um, that said, I know the Hebrew Home, the bigger organization, River Spring Health, um, of which the Hebrew Home is a part, um, has, is, has embarked on supportive services with housing um, in the community. 
uh, sorry, housing with supportive services in the community. And in, in those, we are actually, um, they are taking in um, older people who are homeless um, and providing some supportive services because it's, it's so important. And I, I think one of the things that we need to be looking at in terms of elder justice is um, what are the root causes of um, this homelessness in later life. And we're doing some really interesting work in housing court because we see that older people who have been paying rent for a very long time suddenly are now being served eviction notices. And when we do the deeper dive, it turns out that there is often some abusive person who's come in and financially exploited that person and that's why they can't pay their rent now. Um, so there are components of elder abuse in there um, and we need to be doing some of the work to, to be looking in housing courts and other places to figure out what the root causes are and how we can deal with it. Absolutely. Well, thank you both um, for that question. And then I noticed that we have a few quick questions that we can address if we can't get through all. It's three. Um, we could just uh, get in contact with the people that submitted the question. So April would like to quickly know, do any of your facilities allow for clients to bring their pets? I'll jump in here. <laughs> Oh, you have yeah, no, that's a great question um, because as we know, and, and I've certainly seen cases and our social workers have seen cases where people um, are not willing to leave because they don't want to leave their pets behind. The pets become the family and the only source of um, companionship for that older adult. And with our program, we have um, connected with local pet agencies within our community that have offered discounted rates. And um, a lot of the motels um, that we, and even, uh, I don't think it's the assisted living, but the motels most certainly will allow small animals um, in them with a, with a deposit, of course. So we've factored that in, realizing that the companionship of the person's animal is incredibly important for their emotional um, well-being. So that's something that we've worked into our program. Okay, and let's see, um, Karen wrote um, an SC, most referrals come through law enforcement and their only resource is an ER of a local county hospital and then acceptance by APS if they're fortunate. Most clients return home and into problematic situations um, and just made a comment about um, uh, relationships with law enforcement. So, yeah, um, so I... Yeah, I think that, you know, this um, is that kind of revolving door um, is really one of the things that we sought to try to shut down. Um, and part of the work, and, and I think both Jessica, Jessica maybe talked about a little more, is that the relationship building um, and the need to bring stakeholders together to kind of say, you know, this is not um, a good use of resources to have people going in and, police bringing them to an ER, ER to home, police to, you know, like th that constant thing, we need to, um, to figure out a way to stop that cycle. Um, and, and it's bringing the resources together to say who can do what um, to help shift this a little bit. Because I think law enforcement, um, ambulances, uh, EMTs, they're being asked to, firemen are being asked to do a lot for older people um, in some of these domains and they are looking for solutions. Um, and, you know, it, it has to, with, with partnerships, everybody has to do a little bit um, to make it work. So we're happy to help you and Jessica too, I'm sure, to think about what are the ways to be changing the conversation or starting conversation with law enforcement um, to, um, to be thinking about how we can, you know, shift some of these things that have been going on for a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. Those connections are really important to have success with any program, really. Um, and then, and so finally, just, sometimes it just takes an outside person sometimes who's not, um, doesn't have the history in the community and kind of some of the baggage to be able to say, so this is what other communities have been able to do um, and to bring kind of a fresh voice into that conversation. So. And talk about even what might have worked in their vicinity. So. Exactly. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you either. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's fine. 
Um, and then the last comment is from Mary, and this is specifically for you, Joy. Um, she had a question about payment and billing um, and how you mentioned Medicaid and Medicare, how that could be utilized. And so she wants to know, just for her own edification, how that could be billed. Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, for um, many of the people that are coming in, I mean, when you think about who needs the resources of shelter, often it's people who don't have any other resources or connection. There's, there's no other options for them. And many of those people are either um, people who are um, poor or they've lost all their money because of financial exploitation. So we work with our um, finance department um, if they are already on community Medicaid to try to convert that to institutional Medicaid, um, if they're not, to help them get enrolled in Medicaid. So we work with them um, to try to get uh, them the, the appropriate benefits and services that they, that they should be getting or that they should be, uh, that they're entitled to. Um, if they've lost all their money um, because of financial exploitation, um, we try to work with the police or other resources to, um, you know, to be able to demonstrate that, that there's been a crime committed. And so maybe they could apply um, because of that. Um, for our shelter, we don't, um, their ability to pay um, for shelter is not a criteria for admission. If we can get paid, obviously we're going to try to, um, but if someone for some reasons cannot pay, um, we, we don't, we wouldn't reject them to come into shelter because of that. Um, but again, sometimes it's creative um, resourcing on, um, on the spilling. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so for the good of the order, um, and since we are a little bit past the hour, I think it's safe to say that we will conclude today's webinar. Thank you again to our wonderful panelists, presenters, and for everyone across the country who has joined us. Just reiterating, we will be providing contact information from all of our centers, and we will be taking between a week or two to get the actual recording out and an archive of the slides. And most likely through the NCEA, we will be housing it to our training resources on elder abuse training repository. So we'll be sure to link you directly to that information. Um, thank you again, and we hope you all have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you.